Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to today's Conservation Reserve Program informational meeting where we will present information about the 2021 CRP general signup taking place from January 4th to February 12th. On today's agenda, we will be discussing why CRP, why now, eligibility and enrollment, soil rental rates, the ranking process, eligible practices, establishment and management, and other related topics. On the average farm, regardless of location, 20% of the farm loses money, 20% of the farm breaks even, and 60% of the farm turns the total profit. This is according to Dr. Michael Swanson, an ag economist, uh, where he also says, not all ag ground is created equal. There are things that farmers can do to improve the quality of farmland, including tiling and management. Still, the quality of the land is the most important key for obtaining profitability. Farmers who want to be the most successful operators long-term will farm only the best ground and will stay off of the poor ground. 60% of the ag ground in the United States produces 100% of the profits. 20% breaks even on an ongoing basis and 20% of the farm fields consistently lose money. Those statistics hold true across all markets, whether the corn is $2 or $4 a bushel, because the price of the inputs and the price of the farmland will adjust itself to make that true. Farmers face the challenge of making a living from the land while protecting our natural resources through sound farming practices. The key to meeting this challenge successfully is a plan for managing all the farm's resources. Often environmentally sensitive field areas are also the least productive acres. Soil erosion, um, protecting topsoil by taking highly erodible land out of crop production and putting it into some sort of program like the CRP program is one option. Soil erosion on cropland is of particular interest because of its on-site impacts on soil quality and crop productivity, and its off-site impacts on water quantity and quality, air quality, and biological activity. Dust contributions to the atmosphere and delivery of sediment, nutrients, and chemicals to water resources our primary environmental concerns. In this picture, you can see runoff, um, you know, putting in place these conservation programs to filter the water and reduce sedimentation will ultimately improve water quality by controlling runoff and sediment and associated pollutants. Farming more acres does not necessarily mean making more money. The quality of the land is the most important key for obtaining profitability. With high corn prices, some farms thought they could raise crops on marginal land. Many times though, poor farmland will not make an acceptable return on investment for the grower or the operator. In this picture, you can see some poor soils um, where we could identify some field areas with soil limitations that are not consistently profitable and target those areas to use conservation reserve program practices. Machinery management decisions should also be considered in field operations. Often odd field shapes, obstacles, or contour farming will require operators to increase the complexity of the machinery maneuvering. This usually reduces machine efficiency and crop input efficiency. In this picture, you can see um, some odd areas of these fields. You can use conservation reserve program practices to square up fields and reduce point rows to ease up equipment operation in hard to farm field areas. Some other areas you can consider on your operation are field edges. Partial enrollment might increase farm income by reducing input costs on less productive acres. The last photo here shows the first 20 rows of production from a cornfield with a shelter belt that ran along the edge of the field. 
This is a great visual example of how the judicious use of conservation programs can actually increase farm and ranch income by reducing input costs in a production situation where the landowner ends up upside down on costs and profits. The moral of the story here is to stop farming unprofitable acres. An Iowa farmer mentioned there were five acres where we were losing an average of $280 per acre each year, according to a submission he put in the Corn and Soybean Digest. One thing you need to ask yourself, are you farming in the red? Successful farmers know that keeping unproductive, hard to farm acres in production can hurt their farm profitability. When you consider the impact of soil limitations and crop budgets, it makes sense to quit growing crops in areas that lose money every single year. So let's go ahead and show you what that looks like. What is it worth to you? Here's an example of a 35 acre field with five years of yield monitoring data for corn and soybeans. Warm colors, red, orange, yellow, indicate areas with lower yields. If you watched our CRP informational meetings in the past, you've heard us say this before, and we use this saying a lot, but farm the best and conserve the rest. We are in the process of holding landowner informational meetings like this one across the state and meetings across the country. However, due to uncontrollable circumstances, this year, we are not doing any in-person meetings, but we are doing these virtual presentations where we will host some Q&A sessions afterwards uh, to answer any questions you may have. We want to help landowners interested in enrolling in CRP increase their odds of being accepted and understand how the decisions they can control will impact their CRP score. Depending on your reasons for enrolling land into CRP, you have a few options as to how you can increase your EBI score. Much of your score though is dependent upon things you can't really control. Things like how erosive your soils are, what types of slope you have on your ground, or if your land happens to be in a conservation priority area. We will discuss this later in the presentation. CRP has a legacy of protecting our natural resources through voluntary participation. While providing significant economic and environmental, environmental benefits to rural communities across the United States. Again, the general sign up will take place from January 4th to February 12th of 2021. Whether you are looking to enroll CRP acres for the first time or have CRP acres and are looking to re enroll, you really need to just sit down and figure out what are your farm goals. Conservation planning is a fundamental starting point for maintaining and improving the natural resources that support a productive and profitable agricultural operation. Whether your goals are to increase farm income, conserve soil and water, establish wildlife habitat, or secure your farm's future, there's likely an option for you to consider. This CRP presentation is directly geared towards the CRP General Sign Up 56, which again takes place from January 4th to February 12th of 2021. We will also be including some CRP continuous sign up information, um, and that is Sign Up 55. That actually started on October 1st, and uh, we will go over some more in depth information later in this presentation. The information listed on this slide shows you where to go to register for one of the virtual question and answer meeting times. We are directing people interested in attending one of the Q&A sessions to the link on the Pheasants Forever website at the bottom of this slide so we can send out a meeting invite and Zoom link. We plan to host three Q&A sessions. Those dates and times are as follows. January 19th at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. January 20th at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, and January 21st at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. 
If you can attend one of these sessions, we can hopefully answer any questions you might have regarding this presentation and the upcoming sign up. Hello, everyone. My name is Jana Ingerson Laws. I'm a conservation specialist at the Nebraska State Office uh, with Farm Service Agency. I'm going to be reviewing a few of our slides about CRP and the signups going on currently. First slide CRP sign up period. Currently, we are signing up for continuous sign up 55. This sign up started October 1st of 2020 and is ongoing through 2021. General sign up 56 is slated to begin January 4th, 2021, and will run through February 12th of 2021. We're also going to have a CRP grassland sign up, and that sign up will begin March 15th of 2021 and concludes April 23rd of 2021. A few of our owner eligibility requirements in order to enroll in CRP would be that you have to own the land for 12 months before the close of general sign up or at the time of the offer for a continuous sign up. The second point would be you can acquire land by will or succession as a result of a death or the land can be acquired under other circumstances other than for placing it into CRP as determined by the W Administrator for Farm Programs. Below is a listing of our eligibility criteria for operators. The operator is eligible to offer land if all of the following are met. The operator must have operated the land for 12 months before the close of current signup for general and CRP grasslands. Also operated the land for 12 months before submitting the offer for continuous signup. There must be satisfactory evidence provided as determined by county committee that shows control of the land will remain uninterrupted during that contract period. Eligible producers may include individuals, partnerships, joint ventures, corporations, LLCs, limited partnerships, limited liability partnerships, estates, trusts, uh, state and local governments, public schools, churches, charities, nonprofit groups, Indian tribal ventures, the BIA or Indian represented by BIA, and also individuals operating a small business. There are a few times when uh, the waiver of ownership requirements can occur. It would be when there's a leased farm with an option to buy, operated the farm for more than 12 months, then purchased. If the land was owned for more than 12 months, purchases additional land and combines the farms. Or also if the producers owned the land for more than 12 months, lost the land in a foreclosure and regained through right of redemption. CRP is subject to AGI. So to be eligible for CRP payments, producers whose average AGI exceeds $900,000 would not be eligible. All contract shareholders that are greater than 0%, including members of entities, must provide an AGI certification. This is going to be based on the fiscal year of the contract approval and is going to bind for the life of that contract back into that fiscal year of contract approval. The AGI form must be obtained and loaded prior to any contract approval. CRP land eligibility. Eligible cropland includes, includes cropland that must be both of the following. It has to be planted or considered planted to an ag commodity during four of the six crop years. Currently, we're looking at 2012 through 2017 in this farm bill physically and legally capable of being planted in a normal manner to an ag commodity. So cropland has to meet both of those definitions in order to be eligible for CRP. Considered planted for CRP. Conserving use is considered planted for cropping history purposes when the acreage is planted 2012 through 2017 in alfalfa, any other multi-year grass legumes or summer follow or if it's in any rotation, and in this case, we're going to look at 2006 through 2017 of planted alfalfa, other multi-year grasses or legumes, or summer fallow, or any land previously in CRP or grass cover that continued to be maintained as CRP. It still has to meet all eligibility criteria, but any land previously in CRP, as long as it's been maintained, may be eligible. 
Considered planted for CRP also includes land that the producer received crop insurance indemnity payments for prevented planting, or if that cropland previously enrolled in CRP maintains cropping history during the contract period. Just a continuation of our CRP land eligibility would be that acreage enrolled in CRP maintains its status as eligible cropland. Therefore, acreage currently enrolled in CRP is eligible to be offered for re-enrollment. Field margins that are incidental to the planting of crops are also eligible to be offered. Any acreage that could be considered planted in an unworkmanlike manner as determined by the county committee is not considered planted for cropping history purposes. These slides are going to contain a few examples of land that would be ineligible acreage for CRP. Any acreage that would be permanently underwater, federally owned, federal restrictions or easements, or acres enrolled in another federal program that establishes conservation cover, such as CSP, EQIP, GRP, or WIP. Any of these items would not be eligible to be enrolled in CRP. This slide also contains a list of ineligible acreage. Any land currently within practice lifespan enrolled in another program, land already enrolled in CRP, existing grass waterways, any land where the producer is required by law to perform a practice or faces enforcement action. These are also ineligible acreages for CRP. So we're going to talk about general CRP land eligibility. General signup does look at land a little differently than a continuous CRP signup does. In order to be eligible for general signup, cropland must meet at least one of the following. The weighted average erodibility in index must be greater than eight of the three top predominant soils. It could be expiring CRP, which means it's going to be expiring in next year, it would be expiring September 30th of 2021 and would be starting 10-1 of 2021. Any land that's in a conservation priority area. Currently, Nebraska has water and wildlife quality zones that if that ground is located in those areas, it would automatically be eligible for general sign-up. This slide contains some examples of what FSA looks at when we're looking at cropping history. So when a producer walks in the door and wants to submit an offer for CRP. One of the first steps an office is going to take is to look at that land eligibility and make sure it's eligible to offer. So we look at the years 2012 through 2017 to ensure cropping eligibility. And this slide does contain some examples of what would be considered eligible and what would not be considered eligible. So in slide or chart number one, Something that's been in grass 2012 through 2017 that shows no cropping rotation is not going to be eligible. Versus item number four, had CRP contracts on that ground 2012 and 2014, and then it was expired effective 2015, 16, and 17. That producer is maintaining that cover as though it were CRP. That would be considered eligible with cropping history. Item number five is hay 2012 through 2017, but 2012 does show that that hay was planted in that year. Since it was planted in the eligibility year, that's considered a conserving use and would be eligible. Item number six shows a rotation of potatoes, wheat, soybeans, potatoes, wheat, and soybeans. This shows a cropping history, so it would be eligible. Same with line number seven. We have a rotation of soybeans, wheat, pumpkins, pumpkins, soybeans, and corn. That again shows a cropping history rotation. Line number eight was idle in 2012. Then there was native grass 2013, 14, 15, corn 16, 17. This would not be eligible. It does not show a cropping rotation.
Again, sometimes we have to go back into 2006 through 2011 if we need to determine that there was a 12-year rotation or a nine-year rotation occurring. And these slides do show examples of that. It shows item number two that we had corn and then hay was planted 07 and alfalfa remained 08, 09, 10, 11. And then we also had mixed forage and then a rotation back to corn in 2017. This would be eligible, it's showing a 12-year rotation. Line item three shows we have a rotation of alfalfa, corn, beans. Producer has planted alfalfa in 2011 and then planted corn and beans in 16 and 17, showing a nine-year rotation. Versus item eight, we had CRP and the ground remained fallow and then was certified as native grass for three years and then corn in 16 and 17. This does not show a crop rotation so it would not be eligible. When a producer wants to begin the enrollment process for general sign-up, the first step is going to be expressing interest and in determining what type of practice and what acreage they would like to enroll. This slide contains a list of our general CRP practices. CP1 is an introduced grasses and legumes. It can be a 10-year contract period. CP2 is our native grass practices. That would be a 10-year contract period. CP3 is tree planting. 3A would be a hardwood tree planting. CP3, 10-year contract period. CP3A is a 10 to 15-year period. CP4B is a wildlife habitat corridor, which could be 10 to 15 years. CP4D is a wildlife habitat, and that can be a contract period of 10 years. CP12 is our food plots. That practice can only be used in conjunction with any of the, of the other listed practices. It cannot be a standalone practice, and that contract term is 10 to 15 years. CP25 is considered a rare and declining habitat, and in Nebraska, this practice is going to vary based on where your ground is located, but most of Nebraska is kind of a, like a tall grass, upland, um, prairie type of habitat. Again, the FSA office is going to help you. If you decide you would like to enroll in CP25, they can tell you what kind of practice applies in the county and where the ground lays. And this contract period is 10 to 15 years. CP38 is normally in Nebraska a safe and it's for game birds. This sign up 56, there is no safe option in Nebraska. Um, hopefully next year for the next general sign up, we'll have that option available. But it's not gonna be available for sign up 56. CP42 is pollinator habitat, and that's going to be a 10 year contract period. Step two in the general sign up process is FSA must determine producer and land eligibility. Both of these must be met. We're going to verify that there's 12 month ownership and then with the land that there's cropping history and that it's physically and legally capable of being cropped. FSA is gonna then enter that offer data and do our software system called Terra and we have to know what practice and land eligibility category by field. Kara is going to determine if the acreage offered meets the land eligibility categories of an erodibility index of eight or greater, if it's within our state CPA or if it's expiring CRP. Keep in mind, land has to meet at least one of those three bullets listed there. And if it does meet one category, then that offer is going to be considered eligible and uploaded to our software system, COLS. Slide 38 contains a list of and a map of our conservation priority areas. So these areas in Nebraska are going to be water and wildlife zones. And I have separate slides that are going to show these, but the CPA is compromised of both of the water quality zones and the wildlife zones. But the shaded areas in the purple color here, if your ground lays within that area, it would automatically be eligible to offer into the general sign-up process. Okay. 
The map on slide 39 does contain blue highlighted areas. In Nebraska, these would be areas that are targeted for water quality zones. So if your land does lie within the blue shaded area, and again, the FSA staff will be able to assist you with that when they run the terrace scenario, you would be eligible for general sign up automatically. And you're also gonna obtain some extra points because you're in a water quality zone. On slide 40 are our wildlife zones and they're in a brown shaded area. So again, any ground that's located within these areas is going to automatically be eligible for CRP under land eligibility. And you will also obtain some extra points because you are in that wildlife zone. So in the general sign up, we talk about an EBI. It's our environmental benefit index. So an EBI is what determines your scoring under a general sign up process. FSA is going to discuss with the producer these scoring factors and NRCS may also assist. Your N1 factor is your wildlife habitat cover benefits and their scores 10 to 100. This is going to really vary on what you choose. If we look at our practices back we talked about, kind of the more diverse practice you have for grass seeding, the higher your points will be. And two is the water quality benefits from reduced erosion. And this just has to do with your, EB, with your erodibility index and how erodible your ground is. And three would be your on-farm benefits of reduced erosion. And four are things for enduring benefits. So kind of things such as tree practices are always going to give you a little more points because they are something that lasts longer and provide more benefit throughout a greater period. N5 are your air quality benefits, and N6 is your cost. Step three, once a producer decides if they want to increase his or her points on FSA is going to enter into Coles, our software system, the point score for the mix based on the number of species, what that cropping history is on the farm, what shares the contract is going to be, and what the offered rental rate is. Step four, after the producer selects the desired offer and options and is satisfied with the offer, FSA will print our CRP2, which is a worksheet, and the CRP1, which is the actual contract, and the producer is required to sign and date both the CRP2 and the CRP1. Again, CRP1 is the contract that is signed between FSA and the participant. The CRP2 is a summary of the land eligibility, the EBI ranking factors, the soil map data, rental rate calculations, and cropping history. Step five, after the signup has ended, which in this case will be February 12th of 2021, FSA will analyze and rank eligible offers. And this occurs at the national level. An EBI cutoff score will be determined by the national office and a list of accepted and rejected offers are provided to the state FSA offices. Step six would be that FSA county offices then notify producers of the accepted or rejected offer. Step seven, the producer must notify FSA county office if they would like to proceed with that offer. This must be done within 30 days of the letter and the notification can be verbal or in writing. Step eight would be that NRCS is going to develop the conservation plan and then obtain the producer's signature on that plan. Step nine, NRCS provides to FSA the signed conservation plan and all supporting documentation, including a signature of a conservation district. The 52, which is our environmental form, will also be returned with the NRCS portion completed. Step 10, FSA must complete their portion of the 52, review the CPO and all the required documents. By September 30th, the county committee must approve all contracts and load the approvals in the software. Step 11, any accepted contract for general signup 56 will begin October 1st of 2021.
The following slides are going to have a few notes about the general sign-up process. Modifying offers. An offer can be modified at any time before the end of sign-up, which would be February 12th of 2021. It is important for the producer in the county office to be in complete agreement about what that final offer includes. Withdrawing offers. A producer can withdraw an offer before the close of sign-up, which would be February 12th of 2021. It's not permitted after the sign-up ends. And any withdrawal must be in writing, indicating that you are withdrawing the offer with a signature and date. A little bit about the general sign-up process and the rental and cost share payments. FSA is going to base rental rates on the relative productivity of the soils within each county and the average dryland cash rent or cash rent equivalent. The total rental payment amount is limited to 85% of the county's average soil rental rate. And attached is a map on slide 50 of Nebraska soil rental rates that take into consideration the 85% reduction that a general sign-up has. And these rental rates will be determined by your farm when the, produce, when the county office is running your scenario in Terra. They will be able to calculate and tell you what exactly the rental rate would be on your offer. General and continuous sign-up process. Just a little note about 2021 average soil rental rates. The maximum weighted average soil rental rate for a general sign-up is $240 an acre. The maximum weighted average soil rental rate for a continuous sign-up offer is $300 per acre. After an offer is accepted, producers with acceptable offers may begin establishing the cover immediately. However, if you are establishing that cover before the contract is approved, it is at your own risk. General CRP participants may harvest the current year's crop even when normal harvest occurs after the contract effective date of October 1st. That first year payment is not affected by this harvest date. CRP annual payments are made in arrears, so a participant can expect their first annual rental payment in October, October of 2022 for any sign-up 56 approved contracts. On slide 53, we're going to discuss the TIP program, which is the Transition Incentive Program. TIP was created in the 08 Farm Bill with $25 million to help transition CRP land from retiring farmers to beginning farmers, ranchers, and socially disadvantaged farmer or rancher. The 2014 Farm Bill has added $33 million in added veterans as eligible TIP producers. And most recently, the 2018 Farm Bill authorized $50 million for TIP producers fiscal year 19 through fiscal year 23. With the new Farm Bill, the requirement for, for transitioning to TIP producers must be retired or retiring was removed. All expiring CRP contracts are now eligible for TIP, so you no longer have to be a retired or retiring farmer. It allows for certain conservation and land improvements, including preparing to plant an ag commodity and beginning the certification process under the Organic Food Production Act of 1990 in the last two years of the contract period. This was previously allowed only in the last year of the contract, but now may begin in the last two years. Enrollment in TIP is on a continuous basis until the total funds authorized are exhausted, beginning, which includes veterans or socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers, and CRP participants may enroll in TIP at any time during the two years before the scheduled date of contract expiration. In this part of the presentation, we'll talk about Environmental Benefits Index, or EBI. FSA will rank offers according to the Environmental Benefits Index. The EBI ensures that the most environmentally sensitive acres are selective relative to cost and all offers are considered fairly. 
All offers are ranked nationally and after all EBI scores are in and the sign-up period is closed. Offices will not know the cutoff EBI scores until the sign-up is over. Here is a list of the six EBI factors. Landowners can add points to the ranking score by choosing options in N1, Wildlife Habitat Benefits, and options in N6 dealing with cost. Points are awarded for cover practices and habitat improvements under Wildlife Factor. Native mixes of diverse species generally receive the highest point scores. By choosing higher diversity options, a producer can sometimes increase their EBI scores Wildlife Priority Zones, or N1C, is not something that can be influenced by the landowner. The three sub-factors include wildlife cover, wildlife enhancement, and the wildlife priority zones. If you add up those three sub-factors, you can get up to 100 points. There are several options in the wildlife cover benefits. Significant points can be added by selecting a higher diversity in the mixes with the most diverse mixes in each conservation practice receiving the highest possible points. Pollinator habitat can be included for more points, as well as CP25 rare and declining habitat restoration. However, keep in mind that in CP25, all species must be native to the site for where they are being placed according to the ecological site description. This chart covers the range of points possible for different cover types. Consult NRCS and FSA for additional descriptions. Further details are provided in the following slides. N1B, Wildlife Enhancement, is one of the places that you can increase your ranking points. If you include wildlife food plots, you can add five points to your score. If you include pollinator habitat, you can include 20 points on your score. By choosing to take a percent under your maximum payment, you can be rewarded with additional EBI points up to a maximum of 25 points for at least a 15% voluntary reduction in your annual payment. Producers should consider what amount of annual payment they can accept being paid under their maximum as determined by FSA when considering this option. CP4D, Permanent Wildlife Habitat, are two options you can use to increase your points. 40 points for mixed stand of native grass, trees, shrubs, or forbs, a minimum of four species, or 50 points for five species. This example is for tall grass prairie rare and declining habitat. Species composition may vary for your local rare and declining habitat zones. CP25 often carries the highest EBI points. It should be considered that all species in the mix must be native and establishment challenges need to be considered. Maximizing your EBI will increase the likelihood that your offer will be accepted. We will not know the cutoff for EBI in your area until after all offers are in and the signup is closed. Adjusting your EBI points after the signup close will not be allowed. In scenario one, the participant can offer the existing cover as is and hope their EBI ranking is above the national cutoff score. Or you can use scenario two, the participant convert the cover to a 50 point mix under a CP2 or a CP25 and offer 10% of the acres as pollinator habitat to gain additional points. For this example, producers should discuss the necessary process they will have to go through to complete this upgrade. Consult your local FSA or NRCS for details prior to choosing this option. In this section, we will be discussing the required cover management for CRP contract acres. CRP management is good farm management. All CRP participants perform management activities as part of their approved conservation plan. These management activities are designed to maximize wildlife benefits while ensuring soil, water, and other resources are protected throughout the life of the contract. The purpose of CRP management is to keep the CRP tract in a condition that is providing the best possible wildlife habitat throughout the life of the contract. Where wildlife are concerned, there is really nothing you can do where you would plant it, walk away from it, and have great habitat in the future. By applying some form of management in the form of disturbance to the tract in the future, we can maintain 
most of these wildlife benefits throughout the 10 or 15 year life of such contracts. The following slide displays some of the key aspects we see when using broadleaf plant species in your seed mixes or broadleaf plant species exist on your CRP acres. If you're in it for wildlife, broadleaf plants are a very important part of your CRP management. These broadleaf plant benefits are listed on the side. They provide shade in the summer and thermal cover in the winter, provide protection from predators, provide a food source by attracting insects, as well as providing seeds to eat. Structure provides open ground for easy mobility of chicks. Leaves catch and hold dew and rainwater playing an important role as a water source for both insects and birds. Here we discuss pretty much all of the management options that a landowner would have when it comes to completing the required management on their CRP acres. Below, you can kind of see a list of all the things available. Pretty much you can think of it this way. There's three ways to remove the cover, whether you use prescribed fire, grazing, or haying. And then there's other additional things you can do after the cover is removed to influence the vegetative cover, whether that be a chemical application or a disking activity. Uh, in certain cases, depending on what the site looks like at the time of required management, an interseeding may be needed. However, by choosing a higher diversity option up front, a producer can sometimes increase their EBI score significantly while also hedging their bets to hopefully not to do as much interseeding at the time of required management. However, consult with an NRCS or technical service provider employee for species selection options. Other added activities can also increase your EBI scores as well. The N1C section is, however, not something that can be influenced by the landowner. We previously discussed this. Um, that just really is dependent upon where your site lays, and that, um, that score is found by using other things such as erodibility and slope and things like that. Going in depth a little further about the management options available, we'll start with disking. Uh, disking can be used to set back rank or sod bound grass cover to enhance plant diversity and vigorous growth. Tillage and interseeding at specific times of the year can meet the qualifications for requ required management, formerly called mid contract management. The NRCS FOTG will provide the detailed information about what management practices are available and how they will be performed on the site. Prescribed fire is a very cost effective and efficient way to control woody encroachment and improve grasslands overall. Prescribed fire can be one of the most cost effective ways of completing mid contract management requirements improving overall wildlife habitat, and improving the grazing or haying value of the CRP tract. Cover removal and green up following a fire provides a desirable condition for controlling undesirable cool season grasses, such as smooth brome. Here you see a list of some of the prescribed burn associations or PBAs as you'll see them referenced throughout the state where you could look to potentially join as a member into one of these PBAs and help implement prescribed fire on your property. In an effort to overcome limitations, Pheasants Forever has teamed up with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, Nebraska Environmental Trust, and USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service to develop prescribed burning resources for farmers and landowners who organize into prescribed burn associations. So please refer to this map. And if you're located in one of these areas, contact us and we will get you pointed in the right direction to join a local PBA. Another option is chemical suppression. Uh, this can be used to suppress warm or cool season grasses to reduce competition 
for forbs and legumes. Spraying CRP with selected chemicals at specific times of the year can meet the qualifications for required management. The NRCS FOTG Field Office Tech Guide will provide the detailed information about what management practices are available and how they will be performed. Grazing can also be another option to be used as a substitute for management. The use of grazing is acceptable statewide on all soil types as a substitute for management provided that it is accomplished in a high intensity, short duration manner and the practice is eligible. It can also be used to facilitate another management practice. An example, cover removal prior to a chemical application. To conduct haying or grazing, it must be in the conservation plan up front. Producers must contact their FSA office to map where they are going to hay or graze. They will not receive a reduction in rental payment during the years they hay or graze for management on the number of acres they graze or hay. Grazing can only occur once every two years and haying once every three years on a specific piece of ground. Producers are encouraged to only hay or graze a portion of their CRP each year, for example, one third of the CRP acres over a three year period. Grazing, again, grazing is a non cost shared substitute for management. No payment reduction on most practices it is eligible for. As we mentioned in the previous slide, haying is another option for management. Haying and grazing stipulations. To conduct haying or grazing, it must be in the conservation plan. Producers must contact their FSA office to map where they are going to hay or graze. After haying is a good time to perform additional management, such as chemical applications, a disking, and interseeding, and things like that. Some key points for haying can be a substitute for management, applies to diverse stands, also use as a pretreatment for management. An additional management option is interseeding. Interseeding can be used to enhance wildlife benefits by adding more plant diversity and structure to grass stands. Some sites can be further enhanced following management by seeding legumes, native forbs, or in some cases, even grass species. This may provide enduring benefits due to the establishment of desired perennial species within a stand. In addressing interseeding following management, the purpose of CRP management, formerly known as mid-contract management, is to keep the CRP tract in a condition that is providing the best possible wildlife habitat throughout the life of the contract. When wildlife is concerned, there is really no scenario where you could plant it, walk away from it, and have great habitat for many, many, many years to come. By applying some form of management to the track in the future, we can maintain most of these wildlife benefits throughout the 10 or 15 year life of the contract. And interseeding is not practice, practice specific. It is dependent on the pre-existing diversity and coverage to meet practice cover requirements. Interseeding is also encouraged following management where inadequate diversity is present prior to treatment or when the treatment may reduce the diversity. As we mentioned before in the presentation, diversity goes a long way towards high quality habitat. Some initial plantings are designed to provide early successional habitat to prolong wildlife habitat benefits and the need for management may be delayed to a subsequent, subsequent year. Generally, these seed mixtures will have a low seeding rate, 10 to 15 PLS per square foot, high diversity and less than 50% grass composition. Higher diversity can go a long way in keeping contracts in compliance by providing additional options throughout the life of the contract to meet minimum diversity requirements. 
The seed mixture used to establish CRP cover can impact the options available for management by allowing a diverse stand with early successional habitat qualities to persist much longer. When completing required management or activities of any kind on your CRP, it is important to take note of the nesting season. It's important to avoid management practices from May 1st to July 15th. Management practices shall not be conducted between May 1st and July 15th to protect nesting birds and young wildlife, except when necessary to control noxious weeds, and you can refer to the Nebraska Conservation Planning Sheet 19 for more information. Here we discuss a little different portion of the haying and grazing options. In this specific slide, we discuss haying and grazing not for management purposes. Some key points to follow here must maintain the intended purpose of the CRP practice. You cannot hay and graze the same acres in the same year and must be set back 20 feet from water bodies. Some additional information to consider when using grazing not for management. The key points are as follows. It's allowed once every two years on the same acres. You will receive a 25% reduction of annual rental payment and it is allowed on most practices. There are some updated haying and grazing stipulations. The STC changed the grazing intervals as permitted by the 2018 Farm Bill. The new permitted grazing intervals is one out of every two years. To conduct haying or grazing, it must be written in the conservation plan. Again, producers must contact their FSA office to map where they're going to hay or graze. When considering grazing not for management continued, some key points to follow. It is allowed during the spring from May 1st to July 15th at only a 50% stocking rate, which you will notice is the nesting season. Um, so there's some flexibility added in there in these newer CRP contracts where you would potentially be allowed to do some grazing during the nesting season. You will still receive a 25% reduction in the rental payment during the years that you hay or graze and only on the number of acres that are hayed or grazed. Grazing can only occur once every two years and haying once every three years on a specific acre. Producers are encouraged to only hay or graze a portion of their CRP each year. For example, one third of the CRP acres over a three year period, especially if you are wildlife oriented. As mentioned prior, after haying, when the cover is removed, is a good time to perform additional management activities. This is continued, but the haying, not for management. Um, some key points here, as I alluded to in the previous slide. It is allowed once every three years. You will still receive a 25% reduction in annual rental payment. As I also mentioned before, the STC changed the haying intervals as permitted by the 2018 Farm Bill. The new intervals are once out of every three years on 75% of the field or contiguous fields. The exceptions are CP42, pollinator, and CP43 prairie strips, fields that are larger than an acre can only be 50% hayed. The remaining percent of the fields can be hayed the subsequent year. As for the haying or grazing interval change, we are working on some updates, so foresee some additional changes at the time of enrollment. Uh, besides the general CRP signup that's taking place now, there are also options to enroll your land into continuous CRP. And uh, these next few slides will be going over some examples of how that can be done.
With the general CRP signup, uh, in a lot of cases, you know, you're looking to enroll whole fields um, into the CRP program. Uh, now, with continuous CRP, uh, most of these options, you're looking at uh, smaller practices, more specific practices uh, to certain parts of the field. And, you know, these uh, practice examples here are you know, filter strips, buffer strips, um, wetlands. You know, there's, there's tree practices that can be applied. You continue to sign up. So there's a, there's a lot of different options for, for certain acres, uh, maybe those less profitable acres in the field um, that, that can help you out by enrolling into the continuous CRP. With continuous CRP, uh, some things are similar with general CRP, but, but then there's some different things here. Um, you know, land that's going to be enrolled here uh, needs to meet cropping history, which means it has to be uh, farmed uh, four out of the six uh, years from years 2012 to 2017. They are allowing uh, contracts that have expired, CRP contracts that have expired um, in fiscal years 2017 to fiscal year 2020. Uh, if those, if there's contracts that expire then, they're they are still eligible to be re-enrolled now. With continuous CRP, uh, you do get some uh, incentive payments. So the SIP payment or the sign-up incentive payment, uh, that's a one-time payment of 32.5% uh, of the yearly annual payment. And you'll also get a practice incentive payment or PIP payment uh, which is 20% of the actual eligible cost to install the practice. So these these incentive payments are, you know, you know basically they're there to help uh, get you, um, you know, anything to do with site prep or, you know, especially seed costs, uh, things like that. Those are there to help, um, you know, keep you afloat there during during the uh, beginning process of the contract. Again, those those PIP and SIP payments are a one-time payment. And this continuous uh, CRP sign-up, uh, it's been going on here for a while now, but it, you can sign up uh, in any of these continuous practices all the way until uh, August of 2021 for the current farm bill that we're in now. So it's important to note here with the signing incentive payment or the SIP payment, uh, the, this is only geared towards new land being enrolled into the continuous CRP. And again, one-time payment, and that payment will be 32.5% of the first full year, first annual payment. A quick example here with the SIP payment or sign-up incentive payment. Uh, the landowner has an annual payment uh, that is $100 per acre. That landowner would receive a one-time SIP payment of $32.50 per acre. Again, the practice incentive payment listed here, it is is just like the SIP payment. It's only for new land being enrolled into the continuous CRP. And again, it's a one-time payment, and it is 20% of the actual uh, eligible cost. So an example with the practice incentive or PIP payment here, the total practice cost is $100 per acre. The maximum cost share rate is $50 per acre, or 50% of the actual cost. The landowner would receive a $20 per acre uh, PIP payment, so the total cost share would be $70 per acre. Another example with the uh, practice incentive payment, so the total practice cost is $80 per acre. Uh, the cost share rate would be $50 per acre, uh, or 50% of the actual cost. So the landowner would receive $16 per acre for the practice incentive payment. Uh, which means total that the cost share would equal $66 per acre in that example. These next few slides will dive into uh, some specific practices that you can enroll into in the, in the continuous sign-up. Uh, we'll start with filter strips. Uh, these are strips anywhere from 20 feet to 120 feet wide, um, average width, uh, you know, but just basically buffers along seasonal or perennial streams. Uh, permanent lakes and ponds, and most wetlands. Uh, it's important to note that these strips, uh, if you can, if you sign up in the continuous CRP program with, with filter strips, you can also, uh, another good idea would be to uh, piggyback uh, these CRP filter strips with Nebraska buffer strip program. Uh, you know, there's cases where you can piggyback that program onto CRP and get better 
better rental rates, uh, better cost share, better help getting getting things established, things like that. It's something definitely to look into. Wetland restoration practices uh, in the continuous CRP. You know, you know, so there's there's always it seems like there's always uh, areas and fields that are wet. Uh, th these could be areas where as as long as um, it would meet certain requirements. You know, if if the uh, soils are the right soils are there, the hydric soils um, are there. You know, we can we can look into it uh, if you have questions and stuff. But there's there's options uh, either CP23 or CP23A. Um, which are wetland practices that can be enrolled in for, for wetlands and adjacent uplands as a border around the wetland areas. So with the CP23 um, that's in the floodplain, you can have up to a three to one ratio of upland to wetland habitat. And then a CP23A, which is in a non-floodplain zone, um, you can have up to a four to one ratio of upland to wetland habitat. So a couple of main things, you know, to look at is, is you know, are these wetlands actually wetlands? Uh, do they have hydric soils, for example? And, you know, the other th big thing we'll look at is if it's in, in the floodplain or if it's not in the floodplain, then we can determine which, which practice it would fit for a wetland practice. And there, too, we can look at what, what types of ratios we can have for wetland versus um, upland or, or buffer habitat around it. Habitat buffers. Uh, I think this practice has also been called quail buffers. Uh, this is the CP33 practice uh, with continuous sign up. And these are buffers or strips uh, basically anywhere from on average to 30 to 120 feet uh, wide habitat buffers that are planted along field edges. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the a big note here is, you know, roll at least five acres. So depending on in the field we're at, in the field, we have to have at least five acres of um, these buffers enrolled. Um, one another note here to mention is whole pivot corners are also allowed to go into this CP33 uh, habitat buffer practice. And I think you know this is another a great option, a great tool in the toolbox to be able to use out in, in a field where you know edges of a field, whether it's um, you know those less productive acres along tree lines or something where you know you're you're just you're probably losing money in certain cases. I think this is a really good option to be able to go in and put certain edges of, of the property or the farm or whatever into this practice. Pollinator habitat. Uh, the, the CP42 practice uh, can can be offered in general or continuous sign up. Uh, in the general sign up. Uh, pollinator habitat can be used to enhance uh, your EBI points or offered as a whole field practice with limitations to acres. Um, continuous uh, CP42 in, in the continuous signup, th those offers are eligible uh, for SIP and PIP payments, whereas you wouldn't get those in the general signup. Uh, the general signup does not have a maximum acreage limit. Under continuous signup, CP42 offers are limited to 10 acres per tract or 10% of the cropland on the farm. Prairie strips or CP43, uh, this, is a, this is really a new program uh, with continuous sign up. Uh, like most other uh, CRP programs out there, you know, this, this program will help reduce soil erosion, uh, improve water quality, and provide great wildlife habitat. Uh, these strips are meant to, you know, in some cases you can you could have them act as terraces out in the fields uh, by planting them with the contour and, and having them spaced throughout the fields, uh, just like you would with terraces. And you know, instead of building terraces, you could plant these strips. Um, instead of, um, or, or even if you have terraces out on the field, you can put these strips um, right there along the, with the terraces as well. Uh, we'll talk about that in another slide here. But um, so yeah, these these strips, like I said, they're they're a brand new uh, uh, option here with with continuous sign up in this farm bill. They're you know anywhere from 30 feet to 120 feet average uh, width strips in crop fields. Um, one one key note here to look at is the acres can of these strips 
um, that make up they can make up no more than 25% of cropland area per field. So again, I, I can't stress enough how flexible these prairie strips uh, can be used in fields in, in certain areas of the fields. Um, here's a here's a map here that kind of shows some examples anyway of of where you can use um, these new prairie strips. So you know. Like I said, 30 feet to 120 feet average. So maybe some parts of the field are, are you know, odd areas or um, prone to erosion or just you know less profitable. You can make those areas wider with strips, whereas then you you know you can make more narrow strips other places. Just as long as that average is anywhere from 30 to 120 feet. Um, you know, grassed waterways. Uh, and those, you know, any of those low-lying areas, things like that, you, these prairie strips can be put in. Uh, pivot corners, you can put prairie strips in. Field borders, um, again, those strips through the field that would act basically the same way as, as terraces act. And uh, even filter strips, you know, you can, you can put these strips right along uh, perennial streams or, or any kind of waterways like that. So again, can't can't stress enough how, how flexible this this new program is, and and really how how good of a tool it could be on, on certain areas to to help to to help soil, water, and wildlife. Conservation on the farm, other programs and incentives. So if the general CRP signup or continuous CRP signup uh, isn't going to work for you. Uh, we'll talk about a program here that's, that's just another option that, that might be better suited for you. Pathway for wildlife. Uh, there's three program categories. Uh, the pathway for grassland program, which includes rangeland, wasteland, pasture land. Um, there's the pathway for precision agriculture, which would include cropland uh, and cover crops and the pathway for community habitat which would include places like parks schools retirement centers uh, things like that so this this program you know tries to entail every every nook and cranny every every square inch of anything you know that, that could be uh, thought of for habitat you know we can hopefully incorporate it with with one of these programs the program highlights for pathway for wildlife uh, there is, you know, CRP requires um, cropping history through certain years in order be, to be eligible for CRP, but this program does not require cropping history. Um, so there's a lot of acres out there that, you know, couldn't get into CRP. You could certainly get into uh, something with Pathways for Wildlife. Um, there are annual payment options. Um, there's incentive payments, uh, 75 to 100% cost share, and, you know, uh, Again, unlike CRP, where um, you, you're going to have to sign a 10 to a 15 year contract uh, with Pathway for Wildlife, you know, there, there's one to three year contracts. So a lot, lot different options here uh, compared to CRP. But again, it's, it all goes back to we want, we want to get uh, good habitat out on the landscape. And this program is, I can't stress enough how flexible it can be to, to be able to use in, in many different situations to get good quality habitat out there and, and help pay for, for getting it out there too. Landowners interested in earning additional income on their land should consider enrolling in Nebraska Game and Parks Open Fields and Waters Program, or OFW. OFW is a voluntary program that provides annual per acre payments to private landowners willing to allow walk-in hunting access on their land. Annual payment rates vary depending on the habitat types enrolled and the location of the property. High quality CRP fields are typically valued at $8 per acre and other adjoining habitat can be enrolled as well. Landowners that participate in OFW may be eligible for additional financial incentives that are designed to help offset the costs associated with planting or managing your CRP acres. All properties enrolled in OFW are then displayed in the Public Access Atlas publication, which comes out each fall prior to the hunting season. The Open Fields and Waters program provides a number of different benefits to private landowners. As I mentioned before, landowners can earn additional income on their land in the form of annual per acre payments. 
Another huge benefit is the liability protection. Landowners that enroll in OFW are afforded liability protection through the Nebraska Recreation Liability Act. Hunters are only allowed to access OFW properties by walk-in only. Driving vehicles on OFW lands is prohibited. Game and Park staff post boundary signs around each property enrolled in the program, and conservation officers periodically patrol these properties as they do other public lands. Contracts run one to five years in length and are very simple and straightforward. Although it rarely happens, participating landowners can withdraw from the program at any time, and those that do would receive a prorated payment. As many of you know, the vast majority of Nebraska is in private ownership. This poses many challenges to our state's hunters and anglers. Lack of access to private land is considered one of the primary barriers to hunter participation. The OFW program started back in 2009 and has been gaining popularity. OFW is really a win-win for both landowners and hunters. Landowners can earn extra income on their land, and in turn, hunters who help fund the program have more places to hunt. This program has grown substantially in recent years. Since 2016, we've added 140,000 acres to the program. Currently, 850 landowners participate in OFW, and they have enrolled over 373,000 acres statewide. Increasing access to Nebraska's private lands is crucial to recruiting, retaining, and reactivating hunters and anglers in Nebraska. Providing places for people to hunt and fish helps ensure our long-standing traditions are passed on to the next generation. For more information about the Open Fields and Waters program, please visit our website at outdoornebraska.gov backslash OFW. The Nebraska Game and Parks is currently in year five of the Berger and Pheasant Plan which focuses on improving pheasant habitat and increasing public hunting access within specific areas of the state. Within the eight priority areas identified in the plan, which are shown here, landowners are eligible for a number of different financial incentives associated with enrollment in the Conservation Reserve Program. This includes CRP sign-up bonuses for both new and re-enrolled CRP as well as CRP management incentives, which are designed to offset some of those costs associated with management activities that might be required on your CRP contract, such as grass seedings on new contracts or other required management on your CRP acres. These financial incentives vary by priority area, so please contact your nearest biologist at your local Game and Parks district office or service center. Contact information for these offices can be found at outdoornebraska.gov backslash locations. Thank you for joining us on today's presentation on the CRP informational meeting. If you have any questions at all, please reach out to your local USDA office and ask the local FSA or NRCS office any questions you might have. Lastly, Please be sure to write down those dates of January 4th through February 12th for the general CRP signup. And also, please attend one of the Q&A sessions for any questions you might have. Uh, if you cannot attend one of those sessions, please call your local USDA office. Thank you.